Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Doc Talk. I'm your host, Amir Mian. So, in this podcast, I have conversations with colleagues, and we discuss professional growth and how we could learn from each other's experiences. And by doing so, I hope that our listeners will find value in this podcast. It will enhance their own professional enrichment and perhaps even stir new ideas that could help us connect professionally and grow collectively. So today's theme is about team building, leadership and mentorship. And I am super delighted and honored to have a guest who joins us virtually from Columbus, Ohio. He's the Division Chief, Pediatric Hematology, Oncology, and Bone Marrow Transplant, Professor of Pediatrics at Ohio State. He leads the Center for Childhood Cancer and Blood Diseases at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Dr. Tim Kreit, welcome to the Doc Talk. Thank you, Amir. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Tim, it's so good to talk to you, uh, even though it's virtually. I wish it could be in person. But let's start with your uh, career, your uh, career growth. So, before you moved to your current position of division chief, um, um, you had a very um, of a very large oncology program now, um, with uh, significant leadership and administrative responsibility. You also had a very accomplished research career, starting with basic science you know, when you were exploring. I remember efficacy of the oncolytic viruses for solid tumors, and then moving on to translational research to develop targeted therapies for, uh, uh, for cancers to improve their outcomes. So the question is, what led you to translational research, and why do you think clinicians should be really excited about research? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Actually, it goes back to when I was a resident. I distinctly remember being on the floor taking care of inpatients with cystic fibrosis, and realizing that the only thing keeping them alive was the development of the next good antibiotic. And at the time, that was pretty much the only tools we had, antibiotics, they become resistant to one, and we were just waiting on the lifeline for the drug companies to develop the next one, you know, that might come out a month later or something. So I realized then that uh, research really is key to progress in medicine and kind of that, from that point on, wanted to make sure I devoted my career to translational research. And why do you think we, um, in oncology, you know, we really should work even harder because uh, obviously that ties up to our patients, right? Well, you know, we've proven in our field that research cures cancer. We've made such progress in diseases like acute lymphoblastic leukemia, where the outcomes now are over 90% for the standard risk patients. Not that there isn't room for improvement because we don't want to stop until it's 100%. There's lots to be done, not to mention all the diseases that we're not as good at at addressing. So uh, the impact it has on patients is enormous. And when you do research, you're not just impacting the care for that patient in front of you, but you're impacting the care for all the patients that come after them. So, I mean, no question research is so important in, to advance science. So that sort of ties in well to, to the next question. You know, that's the story um, uh, that I love, the story of scientific discovery and how your own family experience with cancer drove your passion to fight this disease. And I'm talking about your TED Talk uh, that uh, you did about maybe two years back or so and that has had more than a quarter of a million views in less than two years. And in that, you talk about the three quote-unquote must-dos to cure cancer. And I encourage our listeners to view your TED Talk, but could you talk about it and what are the three do's that we should do to cure cancer? Most of the many decades that we've been doing research on cancer, we've been doing the first do, and that is uh, addressing the issue of corruption. So I call them the three C's right. of cancer, corruption, coercion, and collusion. Okay. And corruption is really just the cell going bad you know, acquiring mutations or changing gene gene expression patterns or signaling uh, and and, uh, escaping all the normal controls on cell growth. And that's where most research has focused for for many decades, addressing the intrinsic properties of a cancer cell. Right. So that's an obvious one, but the other two aren't so obvious. And I think they've really come to light with research over the last, you know, five or 10 years. The second is coercion, and that is the recruitment of normal cells to the tumor microenvironment. When you look at a solid tumor mass, and this probably happens in leukemia as well in the bone marrow, but it, mainly in a solid tumor mass, it's obvious that the, they're not just cancer cells creating that mass. 
the and and this is something I didn't realize until late in my career that you know tumors are bringing in lots of immune cells and lots of uh, fibroblasts and other kinds of stromal cells, uh, endothelial cells, well, many cells from the bone marrow, and they're coercing them into doing their own bidding. You know, they're they're helping them grow. They're making them produce factors that feed the tumor. They're making them shield the tumor from immune responses, et cetera. So we really need to address the coercion of normal cells in the tumor microenvironment and how they're aiding tumor growth. And then the third one is collusion. Again, something that a, a particular paper I mentioned in that TED talk alerted me to a few years ago was that uh, different sites of cancer talk to each other. Right. It's almost like this ecosystem within your body. And we, we think of a solid tumor as by itself, and then we think of a metastasis as by itself, but they're circulating tumor cells and circulating factors that go from tumor to tumor. Right. And actually inform tumors. So if one tumor figures out how to evade something, it can pass that information off to different metastatic sites. And I think that's one reason that we've struggled with curing patients with metastatic disease. We're not addressing that collusion between different tumor sites. So uh, those are the three C's of cancer and right. addressing those three C's are the must do's. Right. Now that, that's, that's definitely very insightful. So obviously immune therapy would be one aspect of treatment and management, right? Yeah, I think immune therapy helps to affect all three of those because right. you're attacking cells based on some of their corruption and maybe abnormal uh, mut mutant proteins. You're attacking uh, or you're leveraging the immune microenvironment. And, and although you still need sometimes to address the uh, suppressive microenvironment to make those immune cells work. And then uh, the, immune, the immune system is devised to go throughout the body right. and attack everything. Uh, and so that collusion piece is also addressed with immune therapy. So, so Tim, slightly on a different talk, uh, different topic, uh, let's talk about uh, team building. Uh, I think that's, that's really interesting. And, you know, Tim, you've been so successful at building a very strong pediatric oncology program from ground up. Uh, I mean, this is essentially of international standards and draws patients from overseas. So obviously it takes time, it takes commitment, hard work, and of, um, of the leadership of the team. So if I could ask you to briefly mention the three most critical factors that which you would attribute to this success. I guess the first one that comes to mind for me is trust. Okay. You have to trust your colleagues and they have to trust you to not only do the right thing, but uh, to uh, that, that they have the right things in mind. Sure. Uh, you know, when I first <laughs> came to Nationwide Children's Hospital, which as you mentioned is affiliated with the Ohio State University, and uh, I inherited a team and also built a team. And uh, the I think everyone thought at first I was going to fire them. So they, <laughs> they, they walked around tiptoeing uh, in fear and nobody wanting to speak up or say anything that might may be interpreted as a misstep. So I think, you know, I had to earn trust that, no, that's not what I was here to do. I'm here to figure out who are the right team members, what their strengths are, who's the right person for which roles and let's build on their strengths. So right. I get, so trust that, that I'm going to have their best interests in mind, that, that I'm not going to fire them, that they're free to speak up and be able to be a naysayer if necessary, that that's okay. We need people to be talking and, and working things out, working together. So trust is probably number one, right? Uh, having the right people in the right positions I alluded to as part of that uh, is another critical factor. And then I think you need engagement, which, which to me uh, means buy-in for the vision. So everybody's got to realize what the vision is. So as a leader, it's your job to paint that vision right. and get people to come along with that vision. So they need to buy into the vision, but they also need to be engaged in the process, wanting to fulfill that vision. And um, as part of that, being very communicating, because communication is key among a team. This is this is very insightful. Uh, I love those three terms. So, so you know, somewhat related to this uh, topic, obviously, is you know, you were talking about the team earlier on and having the right people at the right places. So, somewhat related is uh, is obviously professional development as well. 
I, I follow a podcast. Uh, it's called Leadership Biz Cafe. And in it, the host recently, Tanvir, uh, talked, had a conversation with a best-selling author, Sidney F- uh, Finkelstein. And he talked about, in his book, he talked about um, 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 his, um, uh, you know, his observations. The book is called Super Bosses, How Exceptional Leaders Master the Flow of Talent. And the qualities of a super boss that he talks are, they're just talent magnet and someone who modifies the code and unquote bigger system. System and to in, to support the the people. So, in your view, what are the qualities in an institutional leadership within the, obviously within the context of medical settings that really nurtures growth for younger trainees um, and those who are early in their career? Well, I guess the quality of leadership for nurturing growth that first comes to mind for me, I actually learned from our chief medical officer, Rich Brilly, who you. Also know, he know him well. Yes, yes. Um, he's just now recently retired last this past year, but um, uh, he's was very insightful and and uh, taught courses on leadership and and on quality and safety here. And uh, he used to always say that attention is the currency of leadership. Awesome. And that really resonated with me. That if I'm paying attention to something, then other people are going to pay attention to it. If I'm paying attention to a person or a mentee then they're going to like that and other people are also going to pay attention to them. And then, you know, I think there needs to be organized mentorship programs. Right. uh, Because, in fact, when my wife and I were going through medical school and residency, um, we often talked about how it was sort of haphazard. You know, you you maybe landed with a good mentor at some point or maybe someone took you under their wings. Maybe they didn't. Uh, but most people would end up floundering. So I think a lot of programs have realized that now and created super structures uh, for mentorship, uh, for bringing people's career along, faculty development. We have a large faculty development office, lots of offerings and you know workshops and both at our own uh, in, in children's hospitals all, also as well through the university. Right. Uh, there's various um, uh, training programs that we host for leadership. Uh, that are, have formal, you know, lecture series, but also, you know, hands-on kind of uh, activities. Um, and I think, so having some sort of superstructure uh, for mentorship, main ingredient to me is having a proactive mentee. That is someone who's willing to reach out there, schedule meetings, uh, find the right people, and, um, you know, put an effort into their own growth. That's, that's number one. You were my mentor uh, during fellowship training at Cincinnati. That's almost like 17, 18 years back. And, um, you know, over the years, I've reached out to you several times for advice, sometimes for refueling, (laughs) and uh, at times even for a free cup of coffee. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about this collaboration and matching program a little bit. So I think it's really interesting, and it really probably um, has a lot of value for, uh, for both mentor and mentee as well. Yeah, it's something that, you know, uh, people have uh, appreciated, I think, but also have recognized there's limitations, right? You can't rely on a computer to to be a mentor or, or even to find the right match. So it does take some work. It requires enough people entering the system so that there's plenty of choices. But what it does to me uh, most uh, importantly is that it reaches beyond our usual uh, four walls that we find ourselves in. So normally you're going to look for a mentor in your field. And this has this gives you the opportunity to find senior uh, people outside of Hemonc, for example, uh, who might have a lot of good insight into just how to go about doing things, how to go about uh, rising through the ranks, getting on committees, helping you teach, helping you mentor. There's a lot of resources at any given academic institution in terms of the talent pool, right. and I think this is just a way to broaden your normal reach of who you might. Uh, look to, and uh, people then expect and that you might be asked to mentor someone outside of your specific field. And the other thing we've put into place is, you know, as fellows, you always have these scholarship oversight committees right. that are mandated uh, accredit- accreditation programs, but um, we've created a junior faculty scholarship oversight committee. We call it the CDC, a hot term right now <laughs> for a career development committee. And we basically said we want uh, each junior faculty in our division to be mentored by one of the associate or senior 
uh, full professors, uh, but uh, we want to make sure there's representation across our division. So uh, we insist that they have one person from hematology, one person from oncology, one person from bone marrow transplant right. on their CDC, and they're free to have others and outside the division as well. But that's the minimum requirement. I mean, it's it's voluntary, but uh, highly encouraged uh, that they that they do this. The the, the assistant professors. Right. No, I, I love that's uh, the title CDC. I'm sure it's uh, it's the buzzword, and everybody is going to jump on it. So so Tim, slightly on a different topic. Um, you know, even though I want to not talk about it, but I, I cannot help but uh, talk about it. The the big elephant in the room, the RNA virus, um, that's turned our worlds upside down. So obviously, conferences have been canceled presentations off, uh, you know, we've had limited ability to network, connect, and collaborate, and that could potentially delay or derail professional development for at least junior faculties. I mean, although Zoom has kicked in, but it's not, uh, you know, it's not a perfect uh, solution. So in your view, what are the top three things that we as professionals need to do during this time of COVID to make sure that we're not losing ground in professional development? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I mean, we're going to get out of this. Predictions are that we should be able to reach herd immunity from vaccination, not from natural infections, right. um, you know, this time next year. So uh, I'm very hopeful and optimistic that we will be able to go back to having meetings <laughs> and in-person, uh, you know, adventures uh, within the foreseeable future and uh, that this will, is just a temporary problem that you've raised. I think the the there are... You know, when we first entered the lockdown and everybody was panicked and scared and we basically just canceled everything. And and as we learned to do Zoom and so forth, you know, I think these things have been coming back online now more and more. And I do think it's important to, uh, even though they're not as fun than to go somewhere in person or to see people in person, I do think it's important to continue to participate in these national meetings. I'm going to be uh, co-hosting, a, moderating a workshop we just finished organizing that's affiliated with the American Society of Cell and Gene Therapy next May. It's going to be virtual. Um, but I think there can still be a lot done. Uh, you know, we've asked a number of speakers and and so they can still participate in those and get that check mark on their CV of a national talk and um, keep continuing to gain their national reputation. I think uh, online forums like this, podcasts, webcasts, and things like that are ways people can continue to participate uh, and get their name out there. So, so Tim, uh, sort of talking about the um, you know the virtual care and um, digital health and telemedicine. So, how has your institution, how have you, um, you know, um, leveraged this technology to reach out to your patients and to continue with patient care during these COVID times? That's a great question. We, you know, just before COVID hit, we had just finished a five-year strategic plan for our division, and on there was to implement telehealth over three to five years, and we ended up, you know, implementing it over three to five weeks. So, uh, but you know, it took a huge effort by many, many people throughout our institution and our division to figure that out, and we did a rapid conversion of many visits that we could do to telehealth, but. We're actually, and, and it's not as uh, as good as healthcare either. You know, for psych, psycho, uh, psychosocial issues, perhaps uh, it, it suffices for um, follow-ups or maybe some, you know, looking at rashes or things like that, but it's really not the same. And patients need to come in for scans and they need to come in for, for labs other and everything. tests. And so, um, and, and physical exams. So uh, we're, we've rapidly ramped down telehealth uh, and reinstate, you know, what we instead figured out how to do is to do in-person visits safely. You know, we have plexiglass shields everywhere. We all wear masks and, uh, um, and eyewear goggles, uh, you know, and if, and if needed PPE, everybody's getting testing before they come in for inpatients or procedures. Uh, and this has happened all around the country, of course. All healthcare systems have figured out how to do this safely. And uh, of course, blocking workstations so that people are 
still separated in the back rooms or in the waiting room uh, for social distances, et cetera. Right. No, I think, you know, you're right. I mean, we have pretty similar experiences here. So, I mean, obviously a little bit of creativity and reality on the ground and uh, obviously technology and uh, everything else really helps. So talking about creativity and, um, you know, something ties in um, that is, uh, I know is near to your heart as well, entrepreneurship and innovation. So I think, you know, something that um, other industries are far ahead of medicine, like, for example, IT and finance, so within the traditional healthcare system, I mean, we clinicians are not probably trained that much uh, to, and it doesn't, the medicine itself probably doesn't, you know, promote us to think outside the box. So as a physician leader, what's your advice to clinicians who, you know, want to explore innovation and, uh, um, and entrepreneurship? Uh, that's a big one, uh, <laughs> uh, but it's an important one. It is. You, it is it, to try to figure out new things, to just make new discoveries, to uh, test new new therapies, to partner with someone, one uh, it is with new ideas is really critical, and and it keeps us young. I'm hoping. Uh, but uh, <laughs> you know, I think the advice is to uh, one have an open mind, and well, actually, number one is be willing to fail. Right, right. No, except failure. I mean, failure is the biggest part of success. Is is you, you know, as Edison said, you know, I found you know how many thousands of ways not to make a light bulb. Right. So you have to have those failures in order to be successful. And uh, bouncing back from those failures, uh, letting the water bounce off your back like a duck, as we say, uh, being able to be rejected, uh, grant rejections, paper rejections. I mean, it's just part of the business. And so you have to be resilient. So while we're on the same topic of entrepreneurship, I know you have a podcast called A Week in Pediatric Oncology, which uh, you know I quite regularly listen. It's very informational. And I, I think it's highly recommended, especially for trainees and anyone who's interested in following up on you know, where the field is headed. So just, you know, what, do you, what led you to start that podcast? Well, originally uh, in about 2010, I was invited by a private foundation, parents get inspired to form foundations, raise money, um, and one such foundation uh, was Solving Kids Cancer that's out of New York City, and they've had a big impact uh, in, on me and on, on many patients, uh, and, and in about 2010 or 2000, late 2009, they asked me to, to do a webinar, uh, just an informational slideshow webinar on, on some aspects of pediatric cancer, and and we did that, and, and they, they said, well, let's, let's put together a survey afterwards, see how people liked it. And I said, well, can you ask on that survey if they'd like to see more of that? Uh, and 75% you know, of respondents said yes. So we said, well, why don't we keep doing this and make it like a podcast? You know, it's fun. It's fun to talk to people. It's fun to hear their opinions and their stories. So now our, our podcasts are more around the people and what they're up to and what they think are important. And uh, it's just been a lot of fun. I find that very, very valuable. I, I think it's just a different perspective, really. is, is It's a lot of fun to just listen to people that we have heard of or you know, may not have met uh, who are experts, so to speak, uh, you know, uh, around the country. So that definitely is amazing. Well, it warms my heart to see you uh, taking up the cost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that should be a challenge. So, Tim, so we're almost getting close to the end of the podcast. And, you know, in these COVID-filled gloomy days, um, uh, let's talk about something inspirational. So, so you know, when we were initially corresponding on email um, back and forth, so I noted that your administrative assistant's signature has a very relevant quote. And I think it's perfect and so relevant to our times of today. So I quote, um, it's um, um, from, from, the, from the signature, so it says, um, life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass. It's about learning to dance in the rain, end quote. So the question is uh, for you, do you have any inspirational quote and uh, what does that mean to you? Well, first of all, uh, uh, my administrative as assistant, uh, <laughs> Terry, will be very excited to hear you quote her. Um, I did ask her about that quote. It is a terrific quote. I, I agree. And and like I think most inspirational things, it came out of a dark time in her life. Uh, she actually had to to bury both of her parents within a short period of time and didn't think she could really get through that time. And that's a quote that someone told her 
um, uh, that I think really resonated with her and turned out to be true. And she's a terrific person and had, you know, a uh, long, uh, productive life uh, after that so far. So, um, you know, I think she'll be thrilled to hear it. I appreciate your pointing that out. The, the, the inspirational quote for me that, that comes to mind, I learned when I went to, um, uh, after high school, I went to the National Youth Science Camp. So this is a camp in West Virginia that provides three weeks of uh, interaction with other peers. So two people from every state are selected each year and some from other countries these days. And they go to hear lectures on science, but they also go to go camping and caving and rock climbing and do fun activities. And, you know, we built a Frisbee golf course and, you know, we just had a lot of fun at, in the in the hills of West Virginia in the middle of nowhere. And um, and really came to love the charms of that state right? and get to know a lot of people and peers around the country. And I actually stayed on for four more years as a counselor after that in the summers. But there was a gentleman from Mississippi there, and he had a harmonica, <laughs> and he was a wicked good playing uh -huh. tunes on a harmonica. And he, he used to sing this song that resonated with me, and I looked it up later, and uh, the song's by Ben Sidron, it came out on 1978 on an album aptly titled for this discussion, The Doctor is In. Uh, and, uh, but the quote actually comes from a, a playwright around the turn of the century, Wilson Meisner. And uh, so I'm going to do you one better than just tell you the quote. I'm going to sing it for you. Okay, maybe awesome. That, maybe that'll be painful. Let's, but, uh, no, no, let's go for it. Uh, sure. It goes like this. You got to be nice to the people on the way up. Cause you're gonna need them on the way back down. <laughs> so that's my inspirational quote. What goes around comes around, and uh, you'll get your investment back tenfold. Yeah, no, that is so. That is so neat. Uh, thank you for singing, by the way. Actually, you are a great singer, <laughs> and you're so right. I mean, what goes around comes around. That that's definitely for sure. So, so Tim, thank you so much for your time today. I know you were busy, and I really appreciate and absolutely enjoyed our conversation, and I hope our listeners did too. Fantastic. Thank you for having me, Amir. You're doing great work. I appreciate your doing these and having me on and keep it up. Thank you so much. So Dr. Kripe is also on Twitter at kidsonkdoc, spelled K-I-D-S-O-N-C-D-O-C. If you haven't already done so, may I ask you to also please consider subscribing to the podcast. And if you've already subscribed, thank you. Until we meet again next time, stay well. Stay safe.